All right, sir. We ready? We are. Hit it. And now it's time for the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Here's your host, Big Anklevich. You're a fine father! And Rish Outfield. You men smell awful. Hasadiga Ibawai! Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode number 106. Ooh. Now this is Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome to the show, folks. Today, we've got another story by Sir Jason Sanford. That's right. Yeah, has recently been knighted. Well, he's knighted by me. In the Dune Steve realm. That's right. Uh, is it fair to say he is our reigning champion for stories? I think so. I think he's pretty likely reached that now. He and Rick Kennett were sort of battling it out for the heavyweight championship, but I'd say that Sanford is... is I think he put on a little more weight, and now he's the heaviest of the heavyweights. <laughs> You're saying he, he's fat. No, no, that's not a good way either. <laughs> he has given us many stories, and hopefully will continue to give us many more. Today, what, what has he brought us? Today, he has brought us a wonderful story entitled, Peacemaker, Peacemaker, Little Bo Peep. Now, see, that sounds like a song. A song maybe by rap sensation Ankh Oatfield. Oh, yes. Come on, ready? You, you lay down the beat. Peace make a peace make a little Bo Peep. I looked in the mirror and what did I see? A couple of douches with the Dune Steve name? The podcasting world was never the same. Anyhow, I guess we should go ahead. What can you tell me that I don't already know about Jason Sanford? Well, he has been on here several times, so it's probably hard to come up with something. But we do have a little tidbit that folks may not know about since last time. Jason Sanford has a new ebook collection entitled Never Never Stories, which is now available. And there's a link to where you can pick up that ebook in the show notes. You say pick up. What if I don't like E, the Entertainment Network? Uh, what, what, what if I like my books? <laughs> then you're to like be most people. Paper? Oh, sorry. What? What if I like my books to have spines and be made of paper? Okay. Well, it turns out that a small press will be bringing out a print edition of Never Never Stories in uh, August. So if you swing that way, then you can go pick yourself up a paper. Oh, I book. do, baby. I do. <laughs> what? Give, give us the URL, would you? You can check it out at jasonsanford.com. There, there's a link to it. Uh, if you look in the uh, books heading, you okay. can find it there. Well, we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment then. We will, yeah. After the story, we'll get more into that. Th that's pretty cool. I think I may have to pick up a paper edition of that myself. I do swing that way. I like my books <laughs> reproduced with human skin myself, but you know. Whoa. We all have our uh, picadillos. <laughs> Okay, so today's story was produced by Tanya Mil... I can't say the name, but I'm going to try to. Tanya Milojevic. Is that right? I don't know. And it's she's from uh, a Lightning... Lightning Bolt Theater, Theater of, of the, the Mind. Mind. Yes. And uh, yeah, she did that, this story for us, and she did a great job, I think. So you guys are in for a treat. Thank you, Tanja. Check it out and enjoy. Here it is. Peacemaker, Peacemaker, Little Bo Peep by Jason Sanford The sheep led the sheep dogs and wolves to pasture and prepared to gun us down. They lined us up for execution in an old soybean field as the night clouds above built to rains which never fell and the winds gusted to burnings we smelled but couldn't see. I stood by Victor Braun. A trucker I'd arrested three days before for the murder of a young hitchhiker. I'd caught Victor near the crime scene as he worked with bloody hands on his broken down engine. When I'd ordered Victor to the ground at gunpoint, he smirked before complying, muttering about bad luck and cheap ass foreign trucks and his amusement at being arrested by a woman half his size. Care to tell me your name, honey? He drawled as I cuffed him. Sergeant Ellen Davies, I announced, as I smashed his head against the scratch rock ground for what he'd done to that poor girl. But now we stood, side by side, as the people I'd served for the last decade paced up and down, 
activating the best way to kill us. Before me, Pastor Albert Jones of the Holy Redeemer Church sadly shook his ragshag head. Jones had baptized me as a teenager not long after he moved to our little town. One of the proudest moments in my life had been when he once praised me in a sermon for being a true protector of the weak and voiceless. Now, though, he would be my death. As Pastor Jones looked at me through sad, down eyes, I cursed him, causing the woman beside him to angrily spit at my badge. Pastor Jones rested his hand on her shoulder and said to stop. This was a solemn occasion, not an occasion for petty vengeance. He then moved down the row, looking into the face of each person awaiting execution. On the other side of Victor stood Buck, a lanky rookie who, unlike every other deputy, begged for his life. I refused to beg, and, with my free hand, wiped the spit from my shield. How good on you. Victor muttered. Ours was a small department of only thirty deputies, and half those stood in this old soybean field along with the handful of prisoners from our jail. The others were either dead, killed when we made our final stand at the sheriff's department, or had escaped with their families. And we'd survived because Sheriff Granville had walked into the thousands of angry townsfolk with a white flag and convinced Pastor Jones to let us surrender. I'd never seen such bravery. The mob shooting and screaming, throwing Molotov cocktails at Sheriff Granville already shot twice, waved his flag and shouted over and over, We're better than this! We're better than this! Jeez. We're better than this! Sheriff Granville now leaned against Sergeant Glosser for support as blood dripped from rifle shots to the sheriff's massive gut. He glared at Pastor Jones. They'd been friends ever since Jones arrived in town. Jones, embarrassed, said there was nothing he could do. <coughs> Always something you could do. Sheriff Granville muttered weakly. We've been there. Helped each and every one of you. The sheriff's words rippled through the townsfolk. Several people shuffled the dust of old soybean plants, maybe remembering times we'd located a lost child or caught a thief. For a moment, I thought the sheriff's words might make a difference. But suddenly, Pastor Jones shrieked, an inhuman whine his voice shouldn't be able to make. The high-pitched scream of joy climbed into the word peace as other people around him joined in. Their voices were unable to match Jones' high-pitched shout, but they still trilled that cursed word until the mob lost all intelligence and peace no longer sounded like anything I'd ever known. While the crowd trilled, Pastor Jones walked down the line. He pulled out Buck, still begging for his life, and removed the handcuffs before ripping off the kid's badge. He also freed two of our prisoners, who'd been in jail for petty crimes. Pastor Jones ordered them to leave and never harm another. Buck didn't glance back as he ran through the dark into the nearby trees. Pastor Jones shrieked again, causing the crowd to raise their guns even as they kept trilling peace. I recognized the pistol in front of me as my service weapon, now held by my old Sunday school teacher, Mrs. McKenzie. I could only pray my husband received my warning and escaped with my daughter. As if hearing my unspoken prayer, Victor Braun grabbed my handcuffed hand with his own. My palm, hot and sweat slicked, his still coated in the hitchhiker's blood, stains he'd proudly refused to wash away. I hated his touch. I gripped it tightly. Are you ready to fall? He whispered. And then Pastor Jones shrieked, Fire! Fire! And we truly fell. Sometimes you fall well before you know. You fall and feel the impact later. Is it fair to blame a dream for all this, knowing it only released what was inside us to begin with? Or is the dream an excuse? A word to tickle our mind 
A mental escape to overlook the horrible things people have always done. At first, the reports of mobs killing soldiers and police and criminals and thugs didn't disturb us. We thought these were simply revolutions and protests from people trying to change their lives. Events which happen somewhere in the world on a regular basis. But then we saw the videos, heard the eerie trilling, saw the mobs attack while trilling peace as if the word was some sick perverted joke, witnessed how the crowds were controlled by a few individuals who shrieked at impossibly high tones, their voices controlling the mob's actions like a virtuoso caressing bloody piano keys, and the dreams, don't forget the dreams, Trillers mention the dreams with star-gone gazers as if unable to forget the experience, yet unwilling to trust words to describe it. Those few who did speak in detail mention the calling they found in dreams, while those the Trillers aimed to kill spoke of being rejected by their dreams. Before the Trillin reached our town, Pastor Jones called her congregation to an evening prayer session. I sat on the stiff wood pew with my husband and daughter and wondered if it was really possible for my neighbors, my friends, to kill me because of the work I did. Barry held my hand in his massive grip, his calluses sticky with sap from working all day as a logger, while Lucy leaned against my side, sleepy and wanting to go home. I want to go home. But Pastor Jones pushed my worries aside as he thundered at our congregation to have faith. We are all God's children. Remember who you are. Don't allow this evil dream to steal your soul. Amen. We all amened, but none of us said the word like we meant it. Afterwards, as the congregation filed out, Pastor Jones walked up. Makes you wonder. He whispered to me and Barry. About the truth of what we preach. My husband <laughs> laughed nervously <laughs> to the melodrama in Pastor Jones' voice and told our daughter to go play with her friends. Are you truly worried? I asked once Lucy was out of earshot, having long since learned that when people make random observations, they're often voicing deeper thoughts. Pastor Jones looked into me. The look people give when... They want to say something, but are afraid to utter the words. I worry for you and your family, Ellen. He said. You should flee before whatever this is reaches town. I gripped Pastor Jones' hand and told them I appreciated the concern. I have a duty to perform the same as you, I said. As you said, we merely need faith. Pastor Jones looked uncertain. The thunder and grace from his pulpit faded, gone. But before I could press him, my old Sunday school teacher, Mrs. McKenzie, called out to him, demanding Jones describe a theological point about dreams being debated by me and her friends. Pastor Jones chuckled nervously and walked away. Now, only a few weeks later, I'd love to ask Pastor Jones what he truly wanted to say, to ask what had truly worried him, to ask if trillers like him give any thought on the evil their dreams push into the world. Into the ditch, mud and screams and cries, the water only a foot deep, hidden by cattails and grass, as gunshots and flashlights played over the injured and the dead. The mob shot over and over at the shapes in the mud. They hadn't removed our body armor, so many of the deputies survived the initial shots, only to be killed with follow-up shots to the head or ruffle rounds with shredded Kevlar and flesh. But Victor Braun had muttered fall, so when the gunshots rang, we fell and rolled into the deeper water of the ditch. We hid in a tall clump of cattails, my leg burning from a bullet, while my chest, numb, tingled from a round stopped by my vest. Neither of us talked or moved, knowing sound and motion would reveal our hiding place. However, Sheriff Granville's deep voice boomed out from the ditch, mocking our executioners. He'd survived the first volley and now laughed at the mob, cursing them as weak and stupid, until
until Pastor Jones himself waded into the ditch and shot Sheriff Granville upside the head. I reached for my service weapon before remembering it was gone. And there we lay, until the mob's eerie trilling died down, and they wandered off one by one, leaving the wind scudding the empty soybean field above us. I began to crawl toward my fallen colleagues, but I was handcuffed to Victor, and he wouldn't move. Wait. He whispered. Maybe if you left, watching for survivors. I glanced at Victor. He was wet and muddy and cold and scared the same as me, but far bigger than me, over a foot taller with at least a hundred pounds of muscle above my own. If we fought handcuffed together, he might win. But I wasn't going to wait without checking on my friends. If anyone's watching, we'll run, I whispered, or kill him. Victor looked into my eyes as a nasty grin cut his murderer's face. No doubt the bastard approved of such blooded talk. We crawled through the ditch back to the other deputies, their moonlit badges glowing against the darker stains of mud and blood on their brown uniforms. We checked each body, but they were all dead. I'd seen the dead many times in my career, but never so many friends. I searched for a weapon or a handcuff key or a cell phone to call my husband and daughter, but Pastor Jones had been thorough in his search after we surrendered. While the mob acted as if in a daze, something tied in with that damn trilling they made, Pastor Jones had shown a deadly intensity I'd never before seen in him. I told Victor we'd head out with the handcuffs on, but he waved me silent. I glanced around the dark field, looking for the danger, but it wasn't danger. It was a sound, a gasp, a low cough. Over here. Victor whispered, leading us to Sheriff Granville's body. The sheriff had always been a massive man, as tall as Victor, but having long since let his muscle run to fat. Seeing the sheriff's frozen eyes and face still set in a look of determination from taunting his executioners almost broke me to tears. We heard a low curse. Victor and I grabbed the sheriff's large body and rolled it. Underneath lay Sergeant Glosser, who'd been supporting our wounded boss. Victor and I grabbed Glosser and tried to drag him away, but he was still handcuffed to the sheriff. So we pulled both of them out of the ditch and dragged them across the field to the nearby woods. You okay, Gloss? I asked. He was covered in blood, but it all seemed to be from the sheriff. Bastard like to broke my jaw, he said. What? When they started shooting, the sheriff sucker punched me, knocked me clean out. I explained how the sheriff taunted the mob after the first round of shooting. He knocked you out to hide you, I said. Hid you in the mud under him. Taunted them so they wouldn't notice you. Glosser nodded, not saying anything. None of us could. Only staring at Sheriff Granville's body. Even though he knew he would die, he'd fought like hell to save one of his people. Suddenly, a car's headlights flickered over the soybean field. Car doors thumped and several men and women with flashlights got out. We've got to go, I whispered to Glosser. Do you have a handcuff key? He patted his uniform pocket and shook his head. While Victor and I could flee handcuffed together, Glosser couldn't run until we freed him from the sheriff's body. The people from the car walked towards the ditch. I saw shotguns and rifles. One of them trilled peace, and they shot at the dead bodies over and over. Leave me. Glosser whispered. Get out of here. I turned to Victor, ready to argue with the murderer that we weren't leaving Glosser. But Victor merely raised his hand for me to wait. He sat deep in concentration, quietly gagging. The trillers had now noticed the bloody drag marks in the field from the sheriff's body. They shone their flashlights along the wood line and began walking towards us. Glosser waved for us to go, but Victor again motioned to wait. He gagged a final time as the tip of a handcuff key parted his lips. He unlocked the three of us, and we fled deeper into the dark woods. We called them trillers because of the sound they made while killing. It was easier to call them that than friend and neighbor and lover and family. And to know that people once so close could so easily do this deed. We stumbled through the night, avoiding other people. 
We saw several fires in the distance and heard screams and gunshots. Anyone who had embraced violence and aggression before the dream hit, whether as a means to harm others, or seeing violence as occasionally necessary to protect yourself and or others, was at risk of being killed. Somehow, the Triller sensed immediately who these people were and hunted them down. Never mind that the Trillers were doing far worse than those they killed could have ever done. When morning came, we found a partially burned trailer off a back road and hid there. A man and woman lay dead in front of the trailer, both shot down by Trillers as they'd fled the flames. We left the bodies alone and scrounged food and water inside. The water still flowed from the faucets and I washed out the flesh wound on my leg and bandaged it. The wound hurt, but if I kept it clean, it wouldn't give me much trouble. Glosser and I also changed out of our uniforms into some civilian clothing we found. But just in case, we kept our damaged body armor on underneath. Victor seemed amused when he saw me in blue jeans and a flannel shirt. What? I asked. Changes the power dynamic is all. He said. Amazing what a uniform or the lack of one does to the mind. Glossa eyed Victor warily from the trailer's smoky kitchen. We hadn't found any guns, but Glossa held a machete and handed me a hatchet. Victor glanced around as if to ask where his weapon was before shrugging. Interesting trick with the handcuff key, I said to Victor. How long did you have it hidden down your throat? I always keep one in my mouth while hunting. Partially swallow it if caught. Bring it back up if needed. Trick I learned a while back. I shifted the hatchet in my hand, remembering the body of that young hitchhiker and knowing instantly what Victor meant by hunting. Her torso split from gut to chest in one knife slice. Her breast sliced off, her throat gaping so wide I could have slid my hand up to grab her tongue. It was the worst crime scene I'd ever encountered. Even worse than the murder-suicide I investigated a few years ago in the abandoned hotel downtown. That had been the work of a drug-crazed man who hadn't fully known what he'd done to his best friend until he came down. At which point, horrified, he killed himself. But Victor had known exactly what he was doing to that girl. After I'd arrested him, I found a pair of homemade leather gloves in Victor's back pocket. A human tattoo of a heart visible on the sewn palms. The sheriff and I suspected Victor of being a serial killer and bagged the gloves for DNA testing. Figured they were a trophy from another grisly murder. But before we could dig deeper, our world dropped into crazy. Seeing me gazing at him, Victor spit a grin which would have fried fear through most people. She wasn't my first kill, he said. If that's what you're wondering. You're proud, aren't you? Glossa asked in a shaky voice. He'd always had trouble keeping emotions out of his work. Naturally, Victor picked up on this. Huh. Let me guess. He said. You take my existence as a personal affront, which of course makes me wonder what you're hiding. Maybe you dip into the criminal now and then. Or maybe, before becoming a cop, you did things you aren't proud of. I wanted to curse. Not only was Victor dangerous, he was smart. He pegged Glosser far too quickly. Before becoming a deputy, Glosser had been involved in a number of breaking and enterings as a teenager, and even one assault. He'd been destined for far worse crimes before Sheriff Granville took him under his wing and refocused Glosser on high school. After Glosser graduated and stayed clean for a few months, the sheriff overlooked Glosser's juvenile crimes and hired him. Behind me, I heard Glosser step across the burned linoleum and saw a flash of a machete as he prepared to separate Victor's head from body. I motioned for him to stop. Smart, Victor said. Right now you need me. Why? I asked. <laughs> because whatever is causing this is coming after all of us. The sheepdogs and the wolves. Anyone who ever used violence. <laughs> Glossa snorted in disgust, but I knew Victor was right. By sheepdogs and wolves, he meant the police and criminals. And it sure did seem that something was gunning for us. Victor's right, I said. There's safety in numbers. That's why I'm still with you, too. 
Victor said. Unspoken was that once he felt safe enough, Victor would leave. I lowered my hatchet and sat down across from Victor at the chart table. Why didn't you use the handcuff key earlier? I asked. You never gave me an opportunity to escape. I smiled grimly at the compliment and gave Victor the hatchet. When dark came, we left the smoke gagging trailer and hiked towards town. We kept to the fence-lined trees along the back roads, occasionally seeing bodies beside wrecked cars or burned houses. But most houses stood as they always had, giving an odd normalcy to the night. Groups of people also drove by in trucks and cars, looking as if they were going to a cookout or a party, but they were actually hunting. We saw three cars full of people pull up in front of a wood panel home. The trillers surrounded the house and yelled at the men inside to come out. Instead, the homeowner fired a rifle hitting two of them. But the trillers fired back and one threw a gas bomb. The men inside kept firing until the whole house was ablaze and all you heard were his screams as he burned to death. After waiting a bit to make sure the man was dead, the Trillers climbed back into their cars and drove off. One of the wounded Trillers left with them, but the other was dead. Her body lay in where she fell. As soon as their headlights disappeared, we ran from the woods to the dead woman. Her shotgun had been taken, but she had a pistol and a cell phone in her pocket. Glosser handed me the pistol, an almost worthless 32 ACP mouse gun. Still, it might be better than nothing and I pocketed it as we ran back to the woods. Glosser immediately called his wife. She answered on the first ring, and they both cried. She and the twins were hiding in the attic along with Sheriff Granville's wife, daughter-in-law, and grandkids. When Glosser's wife asked about the sheriff, Glosser didn't say anything. How could he? Glosser's wife knew him well enough to understand. Glosser promised to reach them soon. It's almost morning and we have to hide, he said. Hang on until tonight, okay? I heard his wife whisper her love and his two boys say the same. Wiping his face, Glosser handed me the phone. I called Barry, praying with each ring for the big lug to pick up, refusing to believe the worst, even when the phone clicked into voicemail. I left a message and called back, and again, nothing. If Barry didn't answer, my daughter should have picked up. They might not be able to answer. Victor said, with more sympathy than I'd expected from a serial killer. Probably holed up somewhere. I refused to answer as I slid the phone into my pocket. The dream visited me during a few scant moments of sleep, my head on my desk as I worked on paperwork from Victor's arrest. Victor sat glumly in the holding cell near me. I shouldn't have drifted off with him there. But the room felt so warm, and I felt so tired, and the next thing I knew, I was dreaming. I sat in a sunny field as a sweet-smelling breeze whistled the grass and daisies around me. Barry sat beside me, holding my hand in his giant palm, as we watched Lucy prepare for her third grade play. She wore the little Bo Peep outfit I'd spent far too many hours sewing, but where the outfit I'd actually made for her was barely recognizable as a frock, this dream outfit appeared ripped directly from a high-end nursery rhyme. As if I'd actually had time to make a costume worthy of some damn idolized world's best mom, Barry looked at me and smiled as Lucy twirled in happiness. The breeze wrapped me tight in its warm embrace. I felt perfectly, absolutely at peace. But even as I realized this peace, the breeze built up and up into a slicing wind. A wind which swirled like a dust devil as it tasted my memories. The wind saw the times I'd had to practice violence. Saw that I'd be perfectly willing to do violence in the future. I do wish this could be different. The wind sighed in a voice sounding exactly like Pastor Jones. That a hero could, for once, be acceptable to us. Unfortunately, I'm not allowed such choices. I tried to defend myself, explaining that sometimes you had to raise your fist to stop people from harming others. But the wind shivered away my words. The field around me vanished. 
My daughter screamed in panic before she disappeared along with Barry. As the most peaceful moment I'd ever experienced was wrenched away, I felt the dream condemn me and condemn my husband and daughter for being so close to me. I screamed and slammed my fist into my desk, only to realize I was still in the sheriff's department. From the holding cell beside me, Victor frantically shook the metal bars, his face a mix of pain and loss from losing whatever dream of peace he'd also experienced. As he rattled the bars, we heard a trillin rise from outside the department. A slow moaning of peace, which mocked the dreams we'd both briefly glimpsed. This would be a good time to run, Victor said. He was right, but I didn't realize how right until we were handcuffed together and fallen into that mud and bullet jumping ditch. Victor, Glosser, and I wasted an hour trying to find a car to steal, but had no luck. As a result, the sun rose before we made it a dozen blocks into town. The electricity was still on in most houses, and we saw a few people holding guns and talking with neighbors. Obviously, they were continuing to hunt for us violent people. We needed to hide. Fuck. Glosser said. What's that? Victor asked. Not what, I said. He's the deputy Pastor Jones released before he shot us. His house is a block away. Victor shook his head. No. We can't trust him. That preacher let him go for a reason. My gut told me Victor was right, but Glosser shoved the murderer back, pointing the machete at his throat. Screw you, Glosser whispered. Buck's a cop. We trust him. While I'd always been uneasy around Buck, he'd never struck me as top quality police material. We'd still served together for the last year, so I was with Glosser. We had to trust him. We reached Buck's back door as the sun lit the neighborhood in a warmer light than it deserved. Several nearby houses were burned and gone, only char and cinder marking their cement foundations. A number of police and firefighters had lived in this neighborhood. I refused to think about what had happened to them and their families. Glosser tried Buck's door, but it was locked. He knocked several times before Buck walked to the window and saw us. But he didn't open the door. Son of a bitch. Glossa grumbled. He banged again, far too loudly for my taste. And I looked around to see if any neighbors were watching. After a few bangs, Buck opened the door. You shouldn't be here. He began, but we'd already pushed past him into his den. Victor closed the door and locked it. All of the shades were drawn and the lights out. This is not how you greet friends, I said. Buck looked nervously at the carpet. Sorry. He said. I thought you were here to kill me. Victor walked around the house, checking rooms and closets to see if we were alone. Glosser and I stared at Buck, trying to see the rookie we'd spent so long training in the shivering, fearful kid before us. I heard the shots. Buck said. Anyone else make it? We didn't need to answer. What happened to you? I asked. Buck said he hid in the woods until daybreak. As he walked back to town, a group of trillers saw him, but they merely waved and kept on going. After that, I figured they wouldn't hurt me. Victor was drinking a glass of milk in the kitchen and shaking his head at Buck's words. Not that the kid was lying, but something was wrong with his story. I wondered how the trillers knew which people were the fighters of the world, and which were those they could safely leave alone. No ordinary dream gave people such ability. I remembered Pastor Jones' voice in my dream. Whatever caused this wasn't natural, because it involved accessing a person's memories and what they'd done in life, and determining what they might do in the future. Still, nothing to be done about it now, and we had nowhere to go until sundown. I asked Buck if he had any weapons, but he said no, so we made do with my mouse gun and the machete and hatchet. We'll sleep in shifts, I told the man. Victor, you and me and Buck sleep first. Glosser keeps watch. Glosser nodded. I trusted him, and he trusted me. I slept exhausted. I again dreamed of Lucy and her little Bo Peep outfit. Only this time, we weren't in that peaceful field. Instead, we sat in the school auditorium as she chased costumed sheep around the stage. 
Pastor Jones sat nearby and howled with laughter at Lucy's charming performance, clapping and nodding his red-topped head to her every memorized line. But instead of the play ending how it had in real life, with me hugging my daughter, Lucy suddenly ran and panicked through our neighborhood, chased by Pastor Jones and the trailers as peace, peace, echoed in my mind. Remembering how in my first dream, Pastor Jones' voice had condemned Lucy solely for my actions, I begged him not to hurt her. He looked at me with a pained expression and said he'd try to help. When Glosser woke me from my turn at watch, I again tried calling Barry. No answer. My house was only two miles past Glosser's. After we reached his family, we'd get to mine. I sat in the den's easy chair, trying to clean out the flesh wound on my leg. The wound hurt more than before, no doubt from all the running I'd done. Midway through my watch, Buck walked in. I can't sleep anymore, he said, glancing at my bloody pants leg. I'll stand watch if you want to shower and dress that wound. I hesitated, but what could I say? Buck was a deputy. If I said no, it'd mean I didn't trust him. Only a few minutes, I said. In the bathroom was an old radio. I tuned through the dial looking for news, but a recorded message from Pastor Jones was on all the local stations. I showered as I listened. Peace is upon us. It is painful, I know, to do these things. We love these people, but for too long, the criminal has stolen from us. The murderer has killed us. The soldier has attacked us. And the police officer has merely pretended to protect us. In truth, they are all the same. All the same violent person. Once they are gone, peace will be ours. We will beat our swords into plowshares and live in the paradise of a true, eternal peace. I threw the soap at the radio, knocking both to the floor with a loud crash. After drying off, I wrapped my wound with gauze from Buck's first aid kit and dressed. I walked out of the bathroom to find Victor holding Buck at gunpoint, Buck's nose broken and streaming blood. I pulled the mouse gun and aimed it at Victor. Drop the gun! I yelled, loud enough to wake Glosser, who stood in the back bedroom. Ratted us, Victor said in a low, angry voice, keeping his pistol on Buck. I caught him calling the trillers. Glosser now stood beside me, machete in hand. I glanced from Buck to Victor. I'd helped instruct Buck while Glosser had served as his field training officer. Buck couldn't have done this. I refused to believe it. But the pistol Victor held snapped into my mind. I'd seen Buck shooting it before. At our firing range, Victor grinned his evil slit. He had it under his mattress. Victor said. Guess he lied when he said there were no weapons here. Buck's bloody face paled and he fell to the carpet, begging like he did in the Triller's firing line. I promised, Pastor Jones. He said. I promised I'd stay with peace. I even dreamed it. I dreamed the true peace. Glosser cursed and smashed Buck across the head with the machete's handle, knocking him out. Buck collapsed to the carpet as headlights lit the window shades. Victor glanced out front. Two cars. He said. Seven people. I looked out and saw Pastor Jones step from one of the cars. Sergeant Davies! Pastor Jones yelled. You have nowhere to run. Think of your daughter. She doesn't have to follow your violent path. Do the right thing and I promise to gift her a true dream of peace. I tensed at the mention of my daughter. But Glosser pointed up the street at more headlights approaching. We didn't have long before an entire mob of trillers would be here. Out the back door? Glosser asked. I looked at Victor and he nodded toward the front door. No, I said. We charge them, rattle them. We're in no condition to outrun them unless they're afraid to follow. So we charged. Victor shot two trillers. An old husband and wife are remembered from the church's Christmas choirs, where they always sang a haunted version of Silent Night. Glosser slashed the teenage girl across the face with his machete, while I shot the postman who delivered the mail to my house. 
The first shot from the mouse gun didn't stop him, but the second shattered the lit Molotov cocktail in his hand, exploding him to a crazy dance of flames. Despite this, he kept trilling peas with the others. I tried to shoot Pastor Jones, but all I saw of him was his red hair illuminated for a moment by a third car that pulled up. He ducked behind the car for safety. By then, we were past the trillers and running down the street. They're not following! Glosser shouted. They'll follow, I said. They'll wait a bit before chasing us. Get up their bravery and numbers. So we ran for Glosser's house, praying Pastor Jones wouldn't figure out too soon where we were going. We reached Glosser's neighborhood to find the power out. A fire station down the block had been attacked, and the substation next door had exploded when the station burned. While Victor and I stood guard, Glosser ran up the stairs calling for his family. They opened the attic door and fell into his arms, his twin boys hugging him as his wife cried. Sheriff Granville's wife, along with her daughter-in-law and grandkids, surrounded me. I hugged the sheriff's wife as she cried. I didn't need to tell her about the sheriff's bravery. She knew he'd have gone down fighting. Quickly, Glosser grabbed a duffel bag and began throwing food and supplies into it. Victor and I opened Glosser's gun safe and pulled out a shotgun and an automatic rifle from Glosser's days on our department's SRT team. Victor handed me the rifle and ammo clips and I handed him one of Glosser's old sets of body armor. Victor loaded the shotgun and placed Buck's pistol in a holster which he belted around his waist. There's a truck and an old SUV in the garage. Glosser told me. We drive them both, grab your family, and get the hell out of here. I was curious where this left Victor. I'd assumed all along he'd leave us at some point. While I didn't like turning him loose, there was no other alternative. I turned to ask Victor where he was going, only to find him staring at Gloss's wife. Victor looked embarrassed, as if caught in a compromising moment. Even though I'd visited Gloss's wife a hundred times, it took me long seconds to realize what Victor was seeing. Gloss's wife looked like an older version of the hitchhiker Victor had killed. What's wrong? Glosser asked in an edgy voice. I was suddenly grateful he'd never seen the girl's bloody body or the nightmarish autopsy photos. A destination. Victor said, fumbling away his shocked stare. You'll need somewhere to hold up for a while. I got a place. Glosser pulled out a map and Victor showed him how to drive to his land. About 60 miles outside town, up and down several hills and a number of dirt roads. Glosser stared at Victor, no doubt knowing like I did what that house had been built to hold off. And likely, What Victor had used the isolation for. I don't know. Glosser said. I won't go there. Victor promised. I'll head the other way. Wouldn't feel right, you and me together. Seeing no other place to go, we agreed with Victor's plan. We loaded the truck and SUV and drove to my house. Barry lay in our kitchen. His body bled out. There were three dead trillers outside the house and two inside. The shotgun beside my husband was empty. It looked like he'd struggled hand-to-hand with someone before being shot. In Barry's frozen right hand, a tangle of red hair gleamed to my flashlight's glow, torn from the triller he'd fought. Victor shook his head at my husband's body and kicked a cabinet so hard the wood splintered. It ain't right, he said. All these people, they're sheep. They hate violence. They get people like you to protect them and fear people like me, but at the end of the day, that's all they do. Fear and talk and live. I knew what Victor was saying, and if I'd been thinking clearer, I would have told him that he was only partially right. That it wasn't wrong to want to live your life in peace, to let others protect you as it had been my honor to do. But right then, I was as angry as him and wanted to kill Pastor Jones and everyone like him. And I needed to find my daughter. I thought back to Jones' comment about Lucy being shown the true way to peace. He had her. I knew it. When Glosser drove up in front of my house, 
He had a young woman and man huddled in the back of his truck, and another car following them. Two soldiers I know, and their families. He said. I couldn't leave them. I was proud of Glossa, proud of the way he'd pulled his life together from his wreck of a childhood, and proud I'd served beside such a good, decent man. When he asked about Barry. I shook my head and told him to lead everyone to Victor's safe house. I was going to find my daughter. If I was lucky, I'd join them later. What about him? Glosser asked, pointing his pistol at Victor. Victor muttered that he was also leaving, would hike his way out of town. But I quickly told him no. He was coming with me. Victor looked intrigued and asked what was in it for him, but I didn't answer. Merely tapped my fingers across the oily sheen of my rifle. The Holy Redeemer Church sat at the end of our tiny downtown, where it had stood for the last hundred years. If Pastor Jones and the Trillers had their way, it might stand for another century as a beacon of humanity's ultimate embrace of peace. Not that I'd be welcome in their dream of peace, as I expected. The church was also a beacon for trillers across the area. Whatever had infected people caused them to naturally gravitate to people like Jones. I remembered the reports I'd read, how this was happening in communities across the world, before reminding myself to focus on the matter at hand. As dawn slapped its nasty light down, Victor and I sneaked into the old hotel down the street from the church. The hotel had been built during Prohibition and abandoned for the last few decades. Most people avoided its decaying bulk, which was riddled with small corridors and dusty rooms. But I'd spent long days investigating the murder-suicide here, and knew the place inside and out. A good defensive spot, Victor said. But I still don't see why I should stick with you. I thought again of the murder-suicide and wondered if I could really go through with my plan. Ignoring Victor's question, I climbed the stairs to a fifth-floor room, where a small hole in the outside wall let us see the church without being seen. We watched all morning. Trillers milled around on foot and in carts. Each time the bells in the church's large wooden towers rang, meaning a new. Victim had been sighted. Pastor Jones would start his high-toned shriek, which always grabbed the minds of the other trillers and excited them into driving off to kill the prey. There were also a few prisoners in the church, all children. Through the church windows, I saw Lucy and seven other kids, each the child of a local deputy, firefighter, soldier. All looked scared. I remembered my dream and how it had condemned Lucy merely because she was the daughter of a violent woman. Obviously a trap. Victor said. They're trying to draw out the holdouts. Maybe, or maybe Pastor Jones really believes those kids aren't tainted with the violent tendencies the Trillers are stamping out. Maybe he's trying to save them. That's when Pastor Jones entered the church. Through the large windows, I saw him talk to the kids. I don't know what he said, but the kids disagreed with him, with Lucy being so bold as to push him away. Pastor Jones shook his red hair in irritation and walked back outside. I fingered my assault rifle. My daughter was too much like me for the Trillers to let live for long. I had to act soon, but first, I needed to know about Victor. If I asked you to help me rescue my daughter, would you? No. Earlier there was strength in numbers. Now I'm better going alone. No offense, but that's how I work. I nodded. That was the answer I'd expected. Not sure if I believe you. I said, if you're such a loner, why'd you tell Glosser about your safe house? You could have worked your way there. Laid low for a while. Again, not my way. I killed twenty-eight people, mostly women, but also a few men. People see what I've done and they wonder if the killer is one of the sheep around them, their neighbor, their friend. I shifted the assault rifle nervously in my hands, 
but Victor could have killed me any time in the last two days. He grinned his evil split at my wariness. You and me were so similar, he said. We understand evil, even if we have different reactions to it. The sheep out there, they haven't a clue. They hate you sheep dogs unless we wolves are around. Then they tolerate you until we disappear in the night. That's the natural way. That's the life I want. He glanced at the trillers surrounding the church and shook his head. I can't say this isn't my fight. And I am curious. I want to see how far you'll go to save your daughter. But I won't risk my life to help you. And so, that was that. He'd watch but not help. His rambling explanation didn't totally make sense. But if I'd asked one of the Trillers about their words for peace, for a new world, because of a damn dream, would they also match their deeds? Too many levels of depths to the craziness around us. Still, I needed Victor. So, I fell back on the murder-suicide I'd investigated here a decade ago, knowing a secret he'd take in a trade for his help. Something Victor could only do if I let him. I handed him my assault rifle and made my offer. Victor gave me a hell of a distraction. From the Prohibition Hotel's fifth floor, hiding place, he picked off trillers with the assault rifle, sniping them one by one. He killed four before they realized where the shots came from, the sounds echoing and confusing bangs around the downtown streets and buildings. But once they knew where he was, Trillers surged towards the hotel. If he did like I said, Victor had a decent chance. It would take the Trillers a long time to search every room of that old hotel. And by then, well, I refused to think about that part. I sneaked to the rear of the church. Victor's rifle shots and the returning fire provided more than enough sound to cover my approach. Pastor Jones and an armed man stood guard over the kids in the church, but they casually watched the fight through the windows. I shot the armed man. I recognized him as Mr. Hillsbury, the principal of my old high school, and aimed the shotgun at Pastor Jones. You okay, Lucy? I asked. My daughter smiled. I told Pastor Jones you're safe. He didn't believe me, but I told him. I wanted to cheer my daughter's faith but instead told her to lead the other kids to the back room of the church and wait for me. Victor's rifle fire still sounded from outside, but I saw the Trillers entering the hotel. Victor would soon be forced to go into hiding, and I didn't want them to return and find us here. Pastor Jones watched the kids go with sadness. It's my fault, he said. While their parents' dreams tainted the kids, I couldn't kill them like I was supposed to. I suppose I've also been tainted by people like you. I couldn't simply do what I was ordered to. I laughed nervously at the meaning behind Joan's words. <laughs> How long have you been setting this up? I mean, people like you. Pastor Jones smiled. Since before I arrived in this town, and be careful about using the word people on us. It's an imprecise term. I shivered, wondering exactly what I faced. But I understood that there must be Pastor Joneses all over the world directing these dreams and the trillers, pushing them to do things they might otherwise be reluctant to do. It's the human mind, he said. So malleable. Most of you don't realize how controlled you are by cultural constraints and the desires of other people. You made it easy for us. Do you remember baptizing me? I asked. You praised me for my work. I'm the same person I was then. He nodded. Indeed you are. And I've always been impressed with how strong a person you are. I think that's why I couldn't kill those kids. I thought maybe I'm the one to stand up to the insanity my kind has brought to your world. Maybe I'm the one to make a difference. Much like you have done. In that moment. It almost seemed as if the old Pastor Jones was before me again, caring deeply for his congregation and community. But then, I remember the evil he and his kind had brought to my world. When people discover that they've been manipulated, 
They won't go easy on you, I said. Perhaps. But the path to peace no longer runs through you. Even though Pastor Jones was unarmed, my soul screamed to shoot him. To leave him crying on the church pew as he slowly bled out, just like he'd done to Barry. But I'm not victim. I made Pastor Jones kneel, and I smashed his head with the butt of my shotgun, knocking him out. I then ran to the back of the church and led the children to safety. For seven months, we lived in peace. In addition to the people Glosser and I saved, we found other refugees, soldiers and police and firefighters and others, those who understood the need to occasionally take a violent stand for what is right. We don't worship violence, but we don't fear it either. We hid at Victor's safe house in several nearby places. We no longer had much trouble with the Trillers. Unless the Trillers came face to face with us, they seemed to forget that a few of us survived, but not many. Over the radio, we heard the Triller's celebratory message of peace echo from all corners of the world. Even though the dream that caused this behavior had begun to burn off, fewer and fewer people were trilling and fewer and fewer people were being killed. That didn't matter. The Trillers had won. Their peace was at hand. One cold shiver went a day. I stood guard near the safe house as a solitary man walked up the road. As he neared, I saw his nasty grin and recognized him as Victor. I moved from my hiding place, aiming my shotgun at him. I'm not staying, he said. I heard the bungalow down the road is more fun. <laughs> <laughs> I chuckled softly. A few miles from here, a number of murderers and criminals had banded together much as we had. While we mostly kept apart from those wolves... They agreed to work with us if the Trillers ever decided to mount a full-scale attack. Why are you here? I asked. Curious. You tell anyone our deal? I hadn't. Truth was, I'd been ashamed to. What I'd offered Victor was the hidden speakeasy in that old Prohibition-era hotel. No one but the few deputies who investigated the murder-suicide knew the hidden rooms were even there. When I'd been able to explain that speakeasy location to Victor, and how that crazed druggie had been able to slowly kill his victims with no one else hearing or seeing, he'd instantly seen the potential. I told him, if he sniped the Trillers while I saved my daughter, he'd have the perfect lair to fall back on. The perfect place to remind his sheep of the true meaning of fear. I stayed three months. He told me. Came out at night. Caught trillers. Took them back to that room. Had a mighty fun time. <laughs> Way better than that hitchhiker. I gripped my shotgun tight, fighting the urge to kill this evil man. Why are you here? I asked. Wanted to see. Wanted to see if you told the others what you allowed me to do. Wanted to see. That's all. I didn't lower my shotgun as I told him to go up the road four miles and turn at the hidden driveway under the double oak trees. They'll take you in, I said. Tell them I sent you. I'll do that. And you're right, you know. Not to kill me. <laughs> You'll need me in the days ahead. Why? I asked, looking down at the road, praying Pastor Jones and a mob of trillers wasn't right behind him. The trillers are calming down. The dream is easing. Think about it. That dream and the way your pastor controlled people wasn't natural. Now that the sheepdogs and wolves are gone, the chillers are going back to being docile. That worries me. Victor pulled a new pair of handmade leather gloves from his back pocket and slid them on. The bright red hairs on the gloves glistened, laughed full of Pastor Jones' words from the night we'd prayed together at church. It doesn't take another predator to know that you attack the sheep when they're peaceful, he said. The creature who tricked us with this dream of peace will be coming. I suggest keeping your eyes on the up and up. Victor waved goodbye with his gloved right hand, the shock red hairs peeking and wafting to the breeze, and walked on. I gripped my shotgun and watched the road, and waited for more to come.
Author's Note. This is Jason Sanford. The inspiration for my story, Peacemaker, Peacemaker, Little Bo Peep, is rather simple. Among police officers, there exists an analogy revolving around sheep, sheepdogs, and wolves. This analogy holds that most people in any society are sheep. These people are gentle and productive members of society who'd only hurt one another by accident or if pushed to some extreme circumstance. The police, then, are the sheepdogs, working to keep the wolves, the criminals, from preying on the sheep. The problem is that the sheep don't like having the sheepdogs around unless the wolves are attacking. That's when the sheep suddenly love their protectors. As with all analogies, this one has both limitations and truth in how it describes the world. My story is an attempt to explore this analogy and see how, what would happen if the sheepdogs and wolves found themselves on the wrong side of the so-called sheep. The belief, beliefs found here shouldn't be taken as my own, but I did have great fun exploring this universe, and I hope you enjoyed the story. Okay, everybody. Wait, wait, wait. Can we oh. do a, uh, a ye old cast list? Oh, on you, this? you want ye old cast list? Well, I mean, this had a significant a, cast it does. of people I didn't recognize, and uh, it's really all about me, so. That's true. After the story, the cast list. <laughs> I haven't no. done that one in a little while, huh? First of all, Sergeant Davies. This is played by Tanya Milojevic. Sergeant Glosser by Peter Cat. Sheriff Granville by Rish Outfield. Pastor Jones by Big Anklevich. <laughs> Lucy was played by Andriana Marchio. Deputy Buck by Richard Garner. Victor by Jack Kincaid. What about Wallers, Big? Well, there were several Wallers, it turns out, in this story. Well, name seven. Okay. Moses Bissell, Tobias Queen, Sale Marchio, Andriana Marchio, Tanya Milovich, Big Anklevich, Rish Outfield, Dovich. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you. Now, as, as you can probably tell, she has her own show. She is a audio dramatist or would you say she's also a podcaster what, what do you call what she does it's a podcast so you could say she's a podcaster but you could also say she's a but you would have to say dramatist oh that's true <laughs> and then you'll never catch me saying that so we'll just move on thank you tanya is it tanya or tanja i'm pretty sure it's tanya all right but the j and miljovich is a little more tricky for us uh is there any relation between the, your family and the miljoviches i don't think so okay <laughs> figure you know might be a smaller world than we thought you obtained this story for us. I did. Usually it's me that goes after Jason's stories, <laughs> but you found this in Interzone, am I right? In a magazine. The Interzone actually did a special Jason Sanford issue. There was some other stuff in it as well, but they had three Jason Sanford stories plus an interview where he talked about writing and stuff like that. That was really interesting and um, worth checking out. I don't know uh, how many of our listeners read Interzone, but... Well, would you mind sticking a, a link to Interzone in the show notes? I can do that, most definitely. Cool. Yeah, Interzone is a friendly magazine to Jason Sanford. So if you enjoy Jason Sanford stories, then that's one you ought to... Uh, get yourself a subscription to or something like that. Because, yeah, you can find a lot of his stories. I, I believe the sequel to Plague Birds, which was the last story of Jason Sanford's that we ran on here, is uh, going to be coming out soon. I'm pretty sure that they uh, accepted it. Uh, well, you know, I really appreciate Jason continuing to send us his stories. We go back a long way, him and me. <laughs> it sounds like Han Solo talking about Lando, right? Right. Exactly. You'd like him. He's a scoundrel, uh, Jason Sanford is. This story collection that he has published, Never, Never Stories, I looked it over and I recognized a heck of a lot of the titles of stories there. Just off the top of your head, how many of those have we had a hand in podcasting? I'm obviously free longa. That was the first story of Jason Sanford's that appeared on our show. But it wasn't the first story of Jason Sanford's that we had a hand in podcasting, because also you can find in this book, When Thorns at the Tips of Trees, which is the first story that we did, but that actually appeared on Starship Sofa. And that was when we became familiar with Jason Sanford and forged a lasting friendship from there on out. I'm 
thinking I need to get this book just so that I can have a copy of, of that story and several of the others that are on here to be able to share with my kids when they get to the point that they can get beyond the Judy Moody and the and the not uh, bummer summer. <laughs> well, that's a movie, so you know that's not quite the same as reading a Judy Moody book. But uh, yeah, when they oh, get... so that terrible title isn't the ba- from a book? It might be. I don't know all the Judy Moody books. I never read those when I was a kid. I don't know if they even existed back then or not. Your childhood was the lesser for it. Yes, so. very much so. Wayne's World and... Back on topic, guys. Days. Yeah, The Ships Like Clouds Risen by the Rain is another story that appeared on Starship Sofa that I believe Rish played the mayor of the town in that story. Uh, this story, Peacemaker, Peacemaker, Little Bo yes. Peep is in there. And, and Maps, Maps of, of the, the Bible, Bible, which we podcast here. Here, well, the, This one nobody else knows but me, but here we are falling through shadows, which is a, a cracking good story. Back in the box. And class. I say it's cracking good story because it's going to be appearing on Starship Sofa if it hasn't already. Yeah, that was one that uh, Jason sent to us and then realized, oh, shoot, I gave that to Starship Sofa. And so he gave us a different story in place of it, which I believe was Plague Birds. Here We Are Falling Through Shadows was a really good story, and it was creepy as frick, man. I had trouble uh, sleeping at night for uh, a little while after that one. Uh, and, and that's just a sample. There's a bunch of other stories. Memoria, uh, I Can't See That Far, plays in real time. Rum Springs, The Never Never Wizard of Appala- Appalachia, Appal- Appalachia. The Dragon of Tin Pan Alley. <laughs> These are a bunch of stories that are in this uh, short story collection. And, uh, geez, I wonder what happened if we bought this book and said, hey, I really like Into the Depths of Illuminated Seas. Do you think he would, uh, well, we can cross that bridge when we burn it. <laughs> there you go. Maybe uh, if we bug him enough, he'll let us be the uh, the guys who read the audiobook version of it. Oh, you know how much ass that would kick. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, he's done some good stuff for us. He has uh, been very patient with us. And so we thought we would plug this book. And gosh, I hope this isn't the last time he appears on our show. On three, everybody pointed Rish and laugh. Uh, So so you got to perform the part of Pastor Jones. And uh, I got to sit right here and watch you do it. (laughs) And it's something that I've said week after week after week. When we farm these stories out to other producers, they get to interpret the text however they want and give us directions of how to do something. And when she had you say, peace, or the way that you did it, I was like, oh, come on. She is joking with you, dude. (laughs) It's a practical joke and you don't get it. And how many times do you think you, you had to say that particular word? Oh, we did it a lot of times. And the worst part is, as usual, we're recording late at night and everybody's in the other room asleep. And uh, here I am. You know, it was hard. You know, I, I'm supposed to be trilling this word. And peace, you know, I, there's only so much. And, and on top of that, it's saying in a high pitch that no human being could actually do or something like that. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jason. Here I am, a human being supposed to do this. And yeah, it was really difficult to manage to trill and scream and high pitch to get that warbliness. I actually had to raise my hands in the air and shake them violently as I yelled peace so that it would make my head bounce back and forth so that I would get that warbliness. And I would have to look away. (laughs) I would have to avert my eyes. I would have to refocus my gaze elsewhere. You know, that sort of thing. It's funny. Like uh, recently when they had you do the sex scene, just today somebody asked you to do a a lot of weeping and and crying and, and, you know, know, discovering something awful. And uh, I find it really difficult to sit here and watch you do that. I don't know why. (laughs) I didn't notice you just got up and walked out of the room. I think the the reason you must get up and leave is just because you're going to burst out laughing otherwise. And then you know I'd ruin my performance and be too self-conscious to do it from then on. Well, it's funny. They, they are performances. And, and I've found you laughing at me where I'll have like a phony stogie in my mouth <laughs> or I'll wave my hands around or, or salute and do sorts of stuff for a military character. And you're like, we're not on film. Why are you doing that? And it's just the 
image I have in my mind, you know, the performance I'm doing, even though it's audio, it helps Mm -hmm. to do these things with your hands to imagine that you're in costume or that you're in a battlefield, you've got a rifle or or whatever it might be. I don't know, whatever helps, I guess. Maybe it's not necessary. Maybe uh, somebody out there like Jack Kincaid, who also has a podcast, is rolling his eyes because he doesn't need to do any of that stuff. Maybe when you get faced with something that's uh, much more dramatic or just out of your realm of comfort that you uh, have to do that peace thing yeah it was it was unusual and it was funny once we heard the finished product every time you could hear me going in the background i think both of us would just kind of chuckle and look away because uh, every time it would bring back the memory of the original recording i think it would but you really have to put away your sense of decorum your 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 own pride on these things because as an actor you have to just go with it and give your all to these characters or to these performances when you want to hold something back or you want to maintain some kind of you know quiet dignity i would never do that kind of thing mm-hmm. uh, then you, you're a bad actor. Uh, then you're yeah you're doing a disservice to the, the people around you to the the director or whatever you know, somebody who wouldn't give his all to a performance who just wants to phone it in. Uh, well, the I, I imagine that the, the finished product is the lesser for it. And sometimes these things are difficult or embarrassing or silly or, you know, that, that piece thing. I don't know how I would have done it. I'm kind of glad I didn't have to find <laughs> out, even though that part is so ridiculously entertaining and... Um, flamboyant. Like grandiose or flamboyant's a good word. He's the really out there character in this story. Although although Victor is probably a fun part to play too. Right. The fun of having a show that's almost weekly is that we get to be different people every week. And sometimes it's a glamorous part and sometimes it's embarrassing or, or it's challenging. Right. But hey, if we had to do the same character week after week after week, Maybe we would have quit by now. We would yeah. be done. We would be tired. You, you'll hear these television stars who just are sick to death of that character or, or of you know doing the same thing week after week. And, and I think in television now, they try and switch things up a lot more than they did back in yeah. like the 70s or something like that, where every so week... It was so formulaic and you had to say the same line every week and poor Andy Kaufman had to do his lot cut everywhere he went and he just wanted to kill everyone that asked him to... Dulatka. At the same time, there are a thousand out of work actors <laughs> who hear that and they roll their eyes. Right. Who would Because they'd love to have to do a part for a paycheck week after week after week. Right. And yeah, lucky us, we get to do a different part for no pay week after yeah, week. Yeah, lucky after us. Week. Big Anklevich, you're my hero. But yeah, um, this story is really interesting. I don't know if you see it this way or not, but we have kind of our main bad guys, the pastor. Pastor Mm -hmm. Jones, but I don't see that as necessarily being a comment on religion in any way. I don't know if you saw it that way or not, but to me, it just seems like he's the non-violent leader of the community, you know what I mean? And in this particular case, I really love the end of this story where the uh, serial killer comes back and he says, oh, something got rid of all the people who are willing to do violence. And, you know, something is going to be coming along. You get rid of those people and then you can come in and take over nice and easy. And that really makes me wonder what it is that's to come later on in the story. But yeah, I I don't think that Pastor Jones was, that, that there was supposed to be some sort of a commentary on religion with him being the bad guy or not. So you're saying that he could have been a teacher or he right. could have been a, a mayor or he could have been, you know, something like that. Right. Could have been a, the principal of the school or whatever it was that uh, was a, a society wide kind of a thing. Although he does say at one point that he knew this was coming before he even came to town. So I don't know. Maybe there's some kind of a society that, that's dedicated to this uh, outcome Well, he was definitely scary. And I don't know if this is my personal experience, but a scary religious leader to me is scarier than a scary cop or a scary newspaper man or a scary city councilman or a scary fireman or something like that. What about a scary clown? I I don't know. I think a scary (laughs) religious leader is, is... And maybe it's just because I've seen that, you know, that we've, you've seen the Jim Jones, you've seen the uh, Waco, Texas kind of thing where they can 
stir people up in this religious frenzy where suddenly there's no more reasoning with them. And right. I don't know, that really frightens me. And maybe that's just me. Other people, like children, really scare me and other people don't seem as <laughs> afraid of children. Um, and yet, you know, I know somebody that's deathly afraid of spiders and spiders don't scare me. So maybe it's just one of my things. But yeah, just like all of the... The minions, the the parishioners, the followers, blindly following this guy and willing to do whatever he says. Oh, that scares the crap out of me. Well, in this case, I think it's a little different than that because it's not so much that they blindly follow him. It seems like the the dream or whatever it is that they have takes away their free will and they're doing these things against their will. And if they were able to actually think about it or something, then they wouldn't do those. I mean, I guess that's the point. They're not people that do violence. They're sheep, not wolves, nor sheepdogs. So it, <laughs> wow, you've read this story. I have, it turns out. I don't think it mentions it in the story itself. I think in the, in the intro to the story in Interzone, it talks about uh, this, the, you know, the sheep, the wolves, and the sheepdog thing is like an old analogy that I guess cops have been using for a long time. You know, the, the cops consider themselves the sheepdogs. And they're the people that are willing to uh, do the violence to fight off the wolves, who are the people that are willing to do the violence to the sheep. And then most people are just the sheep. They're the people that, just because that's the kind of people that they are, and we need the other folks, the sheepdogs. Well, then there are a number of ways to interpret things. And yeah, that's the beauty of art, is you see what you want to see, or in some cases, what you don't want to see. I don't know. We haven't had Jason's uh, author's note sent in yet, so he may directly address that, and I'll sound foolish now. But, you know, (laughs) I sound foolish even if he doesn't. Yeah, it's pretty standard. Well, well, maybe we'll just open it up. Let people interpret things as they like, and and if they want to comment and say, I think it means this, then they can do that. Yeah, that's uh, one thing we definitely encourage. I think we try and... uh, Insight, folks. We we try and uh, insight. Really? Yes, folks. Do, we try and incite them to comment on stories fairly often. Where we say, "Well, what do you think?" Leave us a call. Unfortunately, that doesn't work very often. There's been a few episodes that we've had where folks get all excited and they comment about this and that and the other. I believe our episode about the scariest things all that right. got an awful lot of comments where people just were like, "Whoa." I'm scared of this and this and this and this and this. And we managed to do a second episode based entirely on the comments that people left. Let's talk about that for a minute, if okay. it's okay. No, it's not. I don't think people out there know how much I depend on those comments. It's one of those, where I'll go to doonsteef.com every five or six days, every, okay, every 10 minutes, actually. And, <laughs> you know, refresh and see if somebody has commented on the story. If nobody comments on an episode, then I feel like, well, people must not have cared very much about that one. And, and that's probably not the case. It's kind of like a, a radio talk show, you know, on a talk radio kind of thing. 90% of the listeners never call in. They're right. just listening. They're like, oh, yeah, I totally agree with that. Or, oh, hey, you don't know what you're talking about. But they just say that in their car. They say that in their office. A very, very, very small percentage actually calls in and says, I think you're full of crap, Big Anklevich. And so maybe uh, maybe people need to know. I, I would really like you guys to send in your comments and send in questions and send in suggestions because it helps us know what to talk about in future episodes. And it also helps us know what people responded to, what people really liked. And conversely, what people didn't like. How about you? How do you feel about the whole comments thing? I remember you said that once to me. That's how you you decide whether a show was good or not or whether people liked it or not is if uh, somebody comments on it. And we spend time... You know, especially you spend time trying to come up with ideas to make funny skits or whatever to go along with the stories that we do. Yeah, I know that you've gotten down and disappointed when you, you know, you make a skit or whatever and you do something and then it never gets mentioned in any of the comments. And you just assume, well, I guess people didn't think it was funny or I guess people didn't like that skit. I think you even told me the other day that you were getting all you were you were mowing your lawn or something like that and thinking of ideas that you could do to make the show funny and then you said you know what who gives up about that because nobody cares nobody's gonna and maybe they do maybe everybody listens because they love it but we just don't know you know that's the sad thing is you could consider it a, a form of donation if you wanted to 
You know, it's the cheap way to donate. You don't have to donate money. If you want to just donate goodwill, happy thoughts, you could get on and just comment about the show in, in whatever way it is. It's- well, just today you told me that anytime somebody likes Doonstief on Facebook, you'll go right out and send them a friend request. I do. And I never even considered doing this. <laughs> it didn't occur to me. But that's exactly it. You know, it's like, oh, hey, this guy likes us. Let's make him our friend. The same thing goes with the show. Somebody comments and says, you know, uh, I like Tanya's production. You know, then we're like, oh, cool. Somebody liked that. But if somebody says nothing, then, well, I put my head in the oven. You know me. (laughs) Yeah, it, it is kind of that way. I'm similar to you. I'm the one that actually posts the show every week that it gets posted. And I'll... I'm the one that doesn't post it on the weeks that it doesn't. But <laughs> when it gets posted, I'm the one that posts it. And I, I know that I can't expect comments on it right away, obviously. Because A, our show is like an hour and a half long at least every week. So it would have to be an hour and a half after I post it before even the first comment could possibly come in for that one person who happened to be like sitting by their computer when ding a hey, new episode and they went and started listening right away and you know that that's not happening people are at work and everything else and they uh you know they get to it when they get to it but i post the show i don't know what it is i have this compulsion that i'll sit there and like you i'll keep checking back every hour or two and and usually i'll start doing that the, you know the day that i post the show keep checking no oh, no comment yet oh no comment yet Well, see, then, like Bosoms and Pib Extra, you and I have a third thing (laughs) that we like in common. Yeah, I just keep watching for, well, when's that comment going to come in? And then when the first one's, I'm like, oh, all right. And I'll read it. And luckily, that wears off as time goes by and the episode gets further into the distance. So I I, I lose the compulsion to uh, constantly check the comments and see what folks had to say about it. Oh, don't you love... When we get a comment on an episode from like 1994, <laughs> and you're like, wow, that was literally a decade before we ever started the podcast. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. We'll even get that. I don't know if you you guys realize that or not, but I, I you know, when, when somebody comments on a show, we get an email sent to the uh, uh, inbox. And so sometimes we'll get a comment on like the seas of Castle Hill Road or something like that, you know what? episode nine or something like that and it'll pop up there and we'll see that people are going back and listening to old episodes and commenting on them i I think it's so cool for some reason just to get that feedback it helps to uh i guess keep the motor fueled i don't know i couldn't agree more what what episode was it where we were talking about we're like a dog (laughs) it needs to be told hey you're a good boy come here i think that was the uh layla the dog episode and we are that's uh, such an apt description at least for me mostly because i i tend to urinate in people's yards (laughs) but also just because (laughs) i'm territory often i'm constantly looking for approval uh, for approval yeah and the people around me i i never outgrew that i i think i've talked about it on the show but i worked on a a, a tv show with william shatner a Mm -hmm. few years ago Boston and, Legal. Right. And he had to be center of attention every time he was on the set. And he would actually say, I kid you not, did you see what I did there? Did, <laughs> did you see that? Did you hear what I just said? And because I love William Shatner to death, I could abide it. But I could see people around him being like, oh, you horse's ass. <laughs> of course we saw it. There you are making sure we saw what you just did. And I'm like that. I can understand <laughs> I said something funny. Why aren't you laughing? Laugh at me. I'm William Shatner. (laughs) I guess maybe that is, uh, maybe it is because we are still childish. Uh, Childlike, I mean. (laughs) Childish is negative. Childlike is (laughs) positive-ish. I think so. I don't know. Okay. But, you know, we're the the kind of guys that still collect action figures and we're the kind of guys that never grew out of any of that kind of stuff. And I guess... Hey, hey, hey. In one of our defense... You haven't bought an action figure in years. <laughs> you know what I got for Father's Day? A great big Buzz Lightyear. Oh, the one that oh, you'd been wanting yeah. to get. Yeah, I was so stoked about a huge, awesome Okay, Buzz I Lightyear. take it back. It applies to both of us. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. I don't know what Jason's like. I would imagine because he's a professional writer, he's as thick as nails. He's as tough as, as 
Burgess Meredith's stool. Um, I think tough as nails is actually uh, the way the expression okay, goes. And see, the I, thick is uh, something thick else. Thieves. Yeah. Okay. I imagine he's pretty tough. But maybe not. Maybe if somebody posts, hey, I really liked this story and I like all of Jason Sanford's stories and I want him to have my children, that he will be impressed and happy and just a little bit of a non-monetary remuneration right there. I think it's remuneration. Is it really? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just being a horse's ass. I don't know. I'm just an announcer. <laughs> Yeah, it, maybe it is kind of a, a childlike thing for us to want. You know, we're like the kid that's always like, hey, look at me. Look, I'm doing a cartwheel. Look. It makes me think of there was an episode of The Simpsons where all of a sudden Homer's mom, who had, uh, you know, never been mentioned, suddenly she comes back and she's been hiding out from the law or whatever. And suddenly she's there and Homer reverts back to being a kid. And he's always doing that. Hey, look at me, mom. Uh, I guess that's a little bit what we're like. You know, we like to do these things and then say, hey, look at this. I made you a picture. Look what I made for you. I made you a podcast. You like what I made? <laughs> Here's my middle-aged handprint. Will you put it on the fridge? <laughs> when it comes down to it, I think everybody likes to be complimented, obviously. Everybody's going to enjoy it. If somebody says, like you were saying, maybe Jason uh, wants to hear folks say, yeah, great stuff. I love his stories. Oh, of course he's going to like that. Who's going to not? And I'm sure he's... Probably not going to love so much. Everybody's going, oh, yeah, another Jason Sanford story. Uh. But uh, I suppose since he is a professional writer, he gets his share of both kind of comments and he has to learn to uh, develop a thick skin. And perhaps you and I need to learn to develop a thicker skin than we have. Definitely. Hey, let's let's talk about that in a future episode. <laughs> All <laughs> in right. a future episode, we're going to record in like five minutes. Oh, okay. Once... Oh, way back when, there was a like a promo that somebody had made. I want to say the guy's name was Nobilis, I think it was, who d does a podcast. And he just did a promo and sent it out to everybody that was just about telling people to comment. It didn't <laughs> plug his show or anything. He just said, hi, I'm Nobilis, and I wanted to tell you about commenting and how it's worthwhile. And then I remember hearing it, I think, on a skate pod and... On uh, I Should Be Writing and on uh, this podcast. Clown pod? Mm, probably not. Oh. I thought that was cool that he did that. I, he didn't plug his show. He, he was just trying to get people to comment, which is a noble cause, I believe. So I'd like to encourage anyone who's listening, if you don't feel like commenting on our show, you don't have to. That's okay. But comment on something, anything that, that's interesting to you. Because if you like it enough to think something about it, if you, you have a comment pop into your head, maybe you should go in and give that comment to the people who created it. Because uh, whoever it is, they'd appreciate it. Be it us or some other podcast. Here, here. <laughs> wow, that was a pretty positive note. Maybe we should end on it. We could, I suppose. Uh, oh, there might be one other thing. Okay. And now it's time to beg for donations. Wow, that time has come again. Yeah, normally when we beg for donations, we just give a, a general plea. Say, please, folks, we, we pay our authors, so please give us a donation. But this time around, we're going to do something a little different. We've done this one time before, and we figured if it went well, we'd try it again. And it went pretty good, don't you think? You know, it's hard to say, because we did get donations, and I don't know, would those donations still have come? It's a question that cannot be answered. That's true. My guess is no. Not all of those donations would have come had we not had an incentive for Yeah, donating. we had something to motivate folks with. And so we've decided to do it again. We said we would change things up. Last time it was a story by Rish Outfield we used to motivate folks with. And this time around, um, we've decided to do a story by Big Anklevich. Oh, couldn't it be Tobias Bacall, please? <laughs> we couldn't get a better author, so we just had to go with Big Anklevich. Well, no, no, it was only fair, because I got to do one, and, and it would be your turn next. Right. So we went all the way back, and, and I think it was my 2008 October Scary Story effort of that year and uh yeah if you would like to hear it and the episode that we made that goes along with it it's a full episode that you can get solely to those folks who can see it in their hearts to donate donate mother yeah I did. we did voice full cast right and we did mm -hmm. music and sound effects and banter afterward just like we did uh, for my story 
And just like we did for, you know, the episode you just listened to. But for me, if people feel like they're getting something in return, you know, it's a little bit more work. But if that's the only way that they're going to donate and that's the only way we're going to continue to be able to put on podcasts and buy people's stories and stuff, then yeah, well, geez, that's not... You and I used to record our stories for fun. Yeah. And so it's something that is worthwhile. It's something that we will do anyway. So why not? Plus, uh, we've said it before, I learn something about my story or about your story when you read it aloud or when you act it out and, and talk about it afterward. It's okay, well, where did you get the idea for that or what inspired that? Or what, maybe that's something that helps us more than it helps them. <laughs> but uh, the story, if I recall, is called Something Out There. Yes. Beneath the pale moonlight, someone's thinking, thinking of, of me. But it has nothing to do with Fievel, it turns out. No, that, that was somewhere out there. Uh, I'm sorry, I've just been handed this piece of paper. Yours is Something Out There? Something Out There by B.D. Anklevich. Now, if you want to know what the deuce is going on with B.D. Anklevich, <laughs> uh, you'll have to buy the story. Buy the story, you have to donate. Earn the story. How's that? All right. You'll have to donate. And you'll receive this special gift. It's like the PBS shows when they do their uh, donate drives. And they're like, become a member of PBS and you'll get this handsome bag with Big Bird's face on it. Right. If you donate $200 to us, you will get this video cassette box worth a dollar 27 that's about the ratio as far as that goes you donate five dollars to the dune steve podcast you'll get this story worth 15 cents <laughs> <laughs> well we, we were talking on another episode about the amount of work that it takes to sit down and write a story the amount of work that it takes to record a story, then edit the story, then put music and sound effects on the story, then talk about the story, then edit the talking about the story, then editing all that together, then uploading it onto the internet. If that was your job, that would be a paycheck, man. That would, yeah. One person was doing it, that would be a week's worth of work, it seems. I mean, it's funny because as we were about to start uh, right before you showed up here today, my wife had actually, she normally got to get to bed early like at seven o'clock so that she can get up because she's supposed to be at work at like 3 15 or something like that and she had stayed up like an hour and a half past that it was like 8 30 8 45 and i'm like hey are you going to bed because uh rish is gonna be here soon and she goes yeah and he's still gonna be here when i get up to go to work <laughs> that's the funny thing is we actually do put a, a lot of time into the stuff that we do here we're, we're generally working on this almost a work day's worth of time each week so it does take a lot of time and a lot of effort and yeah that we do this for you we want to entertain you and we, we would like to be able to continue doing it and that's why we do these incentive episodes is to incentivize folks to donate so that we'll have the war chest to be able to go out and buy stories and keep getting the good stuff that we present to you each week yeah recently and we won't name names but big there was a story that he particularly liked from a real writer and he sent that person an email and said, you know, I'll give you some money for this story. Didn't hear jack squat. So a couple months go by, six months go by, three months go by, a, a week and a half goes by. And he <laughs> sends an email to this person saying, you know, I, I don't know if you got my email, but, uh, you know, I'd really like this story. And he's doubled the amount that he's willing to give. I and mean, I think that was probably because of, you know, the incentive episode or whatever. Still not a word from <laughs> this guy. And so he just keeps like setting aside money for this guy who's never going to sell us a story. <laughs> you know. I think it, our emails must go straight to the spam. I don't know what it is. You know, I, I've tried various tactics I started sending all my emails as plain text emails, just in case links, you know, having a link. Because, you know, you just write, hey, we, we're for doonsteve.com. That turns into a link automatically with like a, a rich text kind of a thing. So I've tried to stop using that so that maybe that'll help keep my emails from going straight to spam. But I don't know. We've got a friend, well, sort of a friend, who's helped us on a couple episodes and he's got a podcast of his own. And he told me once how much money he paid for a story by a, you know, like a real recognized publish best selling author. And that was probably what we pay for six months worth of stories. Or more, more like a year. 
with that, I, I think, okay, does he really get that many donations? Or did he just want a story by this guy so much that he's like, well, I worked some overtime this week and the week before and next week. I think I'll be able to buy this story. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, well, I have a lot of things I could sell on eBay that are <laughs> around the house that hopefully people might want. I used to have a nice book collection that I sold, so now I can... Uh... There's an urn that holds the remains of my mother on the piano. I'm thinking of selling it and the piano. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that there is some work that goes into all of this stuff. It, we also get joy out of it. I, I really enjoy I look forward to us hanging out. Today I sure didn't, but I look forward to us recording these things. And if you look forward to listening to us... Give us a donation. In this case, you will get something out there by Big Anklevich. And you know what? If we were around in 2012 and you were a new listener and you've just heard this promo or the extended conversation, whatever, what would you call this? Uh, you could call it a promo, I think. Let us know when you make your donation that, hey, I'd like something out there by Big Anklevich because... A few months from now, we'll do another one. And, right. and I've got another story of mine that I'd really like to record. And I know that, you know, we've kicked around ideas of things that we can do. And so uh, we'll continue to do these incentive episodes when we get ahead enough with the podcast that we can set aside, you know, a week to just work on that. And also the more people that are donating the more incentive we have to do another incentive episode. <laughs> yeah, and the cool thing about it is you can hear a story by Rish or by me. It's not something you're going to get on the podcast normally. So if you're one of those folks that thinks that we're fun guys, then, you know, you, you could find out what kind of stories we write. And yeah, as far as the donation goes, you know, we're not going to set out a specific amount that you have to donate to get the incentive episode. Just... You know, donate what you feel you can spare, and uh, that will be fine. The person who donates $100 will get the same incentive episode as the person who donates 10 or, or 5 or whatever. No, I'm going to countermand that. Belay that order, number one. If somebody donates $100, they'll get, like, an extra story that nobody else gets and a hug <laughs> from me. And a... Rish will, will make a special incentive episode just for that. We did do that once. So we made an episode just for one listener, and he took his life. So maybe we shouldn't do that again. Yeah, that could be some liability issues there. <laughs> all the donations will have to go to pay off the family. The paramedics you know, were all looking around. It's like his last words were Dune Steve. What does that mean? It's like, it's like Rosebud forever, people will be wondering. <laughs> So, yeah, if you're interested, donate to the show, and we've got an incentive to hand your way. All right. Well, then let's call it a night. All right. This is early for us saying goodnight. Yeah, it's somewhat shorter than the uh, usual episode, but it doesn't always it's have to. It's still not a short episode. Yeah, there's no such thing as a short episode from us, so we don't have to yammer on forever every time. Good night, everybody. Thanks for listening, folks. Thank you for producing, Tanya. Thank you for sending the story, Jason. Thank you for listening. Your name here. <laughs> All right, I've been Big Anklevich. I've been Rish Outfield. See ya. Ready, guys? The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Take two. We do have a little tidbit that folks may not know about since last time. Jason Sanford has... I'm going to read this so I get it right. A vestigial tale. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. Bum, bum,